welcome to part two of the uh, mental disorders lecture. Uh, just like the first lecture, I am not going to read everything on the slide. I'm not going to elaborate in a ton of detail. My goal here is to give you a basic overview of the information, and I hope that you will pause it or go back through the notes as needed to help you um, understand the concepts a little more deeply. The disorders in this uh, particular video we're going to cover are the depressive disorders, the bipolar and related disorders, personality disorders, and schizophrenia. We're going to start with the depressive disorders. These are all characterized by sad, empty, or irritable moods combined with physical and cognitive changes that overall impact functioning. So the difference between depression and just being sad is that depression is longer lasting, it's stronger, and it, it impacts your body and your mind in addition to just your mood. There are four disorders in this category, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, uh, premenstrual dysphoria, and other depressive disorders that are related to medical conditions. So if a person has depression because they have a terminal illness, that's considered to be a little different than depression for other reasons. We're going to focus on major and persistent depressive disorders, though. So major depression, there are five symptoms on the next slide that a person has to have, or at least five of the symptoms on the next slide. One of them has to be either depressed mood or anhedonia, which is the inability to experience pleasure. Depression is the most common of the psychological disorders, and it's more it's three times more prevalent or um, affects three times as many people in the young adult age range, 18 to 29 years old, than in people 60 or older. So it's pretty strongly impacting young people. Um, it occurs more often in females than in males among adolescents, um, and it's Almost 7% of people in the United States report depression um, as of 2013. So this is a super common disorder because it is so strongly impacted by life events, by the environment. Um, so there are a lot of symptoms a person needs to experience either every day or most of every day. Um, depressed or sad mood, anhedonia, changes in weight or appetite, changes in sleep, feeling restless or slowed down, feeling worthless or excessively guilty, having impacting um, or diminishment of your cognitive functioning, your ability to think, and also recurrent thoughts of death or suicidal ideation. Suicidal ideation means thinking about or contemplating suicide and like planning it. Um, so as I said before, the person would need to have at least five of these, one of which has to be either depressed mood or anhedonia. Uh, if you're feeling this way, if you're feeling some of these symptoms, if I'm saying this to you and it's really resonating, please, please, please reach out. There are lots of ways that you can get help for major depressive disorder. You do not have to suffer alone. A persistent depression is basically the same as major depression, but lasting longer. Um, and the, the so the key difference is time. Also, the person needs to have, um, doesn't need to have quite as many of the depressive symptoms as with major depression. So one can have persistent depression that's like mainly sad moods and insomnia, for example, but that still uh, counts as persistent depression if it's lasting two years or more, or one year if you're still a child. Um, suicide is the most severe form of behavioral response to depression. Um, it is a symptom, right? Suicide is a symptom, it's a response to depression that people have because they feel like there's no way out. If you have contemplated this before, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me right away. I'm going to put a number on the screen here, too, for the suicide hotline. If you've ever considered this before, you need to call. There's help for you. Um, people with depression are not alone. It's a very common disorder, and there is a way out. Next category, bipolar and related disorders. These are kind of like a bridge between depressive and psychotic disorders. When I say psychotic, I mean a break with reality, thinking of things in an unreal way um, or not living in the same reality as everyone else. Um, we have bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and cyclothymia. They vary in the duration that they last and also in their severity. Um, but first, I need to talk about the difference between depressive and manic episodes. Um, depression is basically the same as major depressive disorder. A manic episode or mania is basically about an excessively high or elevated mood instead of an excessively low mood. So a manic episode is about euphoria or extreme excessive happiness, unlimited enthusiasm, sometimes irritability, um, quick to anger, excessive energy bouncing off the walls, restlessness, reckless behavior, um, really strong risk-taking behavior, feeling like they're on top of the world. Interestingly, Sometimes people with bipolar disorder consider suicide during a manic episode, too, because the mood is so elevated and so high that they sort of can't handle 
the amount of energy that they have. So the symptoms of mania have to last at least a week. I've listed them here. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. The video that I've linked there at the bottom is an actor demonstrating what a manic episode looks like. So if you're interested in getting some, uh, like a real life example, this is an actor portraying a manic episode. I encourage you to watch that. Um, hypomania is a milder version of mania. The symptoms are similar, but sort of a little less severe and it doesn't last as long. So the type of bipolar disorder is determined by the type of mania. If it's really strong full mania that's lasting at least a week, we consider it to be bipolar one. If it's mania um, that's a little milder, it's called hypomania, that's called bipolar two. The major impairment from bipolar one disorder comes from the mania. The major impairment in bipolar two comes from the depression. Um, people will cycle back and forth between these depressive and manic episodes. Depressive episodes can last two weeks or longer. Manic episodes last at least a week for bipolar one and at least four days for bipolar two. Um, so it's not, with bipolar disorder, a person is not rapidly shifting moods back and forth across a day. They're having shifts in their mood and behaviors across weeks. Um, cyclothymic disorder is when a person is not having quite enough symptoms to match either depression or mania but they're having symptoms for a longer time. So this is sort of a less severe version of bipolar disorder called cyclothymia. And when I say less severe, that doesn't mean it's not having a negative impact on a person. It just means they're not having as many symptoms as bipolar one or bipolar two. Many great writers, poets, and other artists from history suffered from bipolar disorder. Um, they would have excessive creativity during manic phases and then much less during depressive phases. And there's, um, I read an interesting article with someone attempting to diagnose Sherlock Holmes with bipolar disorder based on the different symptoms that he shows, um, sort of phases of high energy and low energy during the stories. Let's talk a little bit about where some of these mood symptoms might come from. There are pretty strong genetic links for both depression and bipolar disorder. Um, depressed brains show, um, much lower activity on a PET scan and manic brains show a much higher activity. So you can see, um, I put this little image in here of the uh, PET scans during manic and depressed states during with someone with bipolar disorder. So you can see how much brain activity is varying between the two um, states. Depression is also caused by something called the depression cycle. Um, so there's a lot of self-defeating beliefs in the way that you explain things that happen to you. It's called explanatory style that can have a pretty strong impact on whether a person develops depression after a negative event. So I'm going to go through the depression cycle with you, but I want you to take a minute and really think about it and try to come up with some real life examples too. So first, some negative stressful event happens. A person can explain why that negative stressful event happened in either a negative way, optimist or like a negative sort of pessimistic way or a positive sort of optimistic way. And if a person's explanatory style is pessimistic or negative, this is all my fault, nothing is ever going to get better, etc., then that negative explanatory style, those negative thoughts about oneself, obviously leads to a depressed mood. Depressed mood, as you've seen, comes with many cognitive and behavioral changes, negative impacts on a person's thinking, um, on their ability to solve problems, on their behaviors. People tend to socially withdraw, have problems sleeping, have problems with their appetite. All of those hindrances to the way a person thinks and acts are going to create more stressful experiences in their life. And then the cycle continues. Um, so it can be, this is why depression can be so um, persistent in people is because once you get on this cycle, it's kind of difficult to get off. Explanatory style, this just goes, this chart sort of goes into more detail about what the different sort of negative versus positive um, explanatory styles are, I sort of consider you to, uh, encourage you rather, to consider this slide for a moment, what the sort of, if a explanatory style is stable, global, and internal, that tends to lead to, de to depression, whereas if it's temporary, specific, and external, that tends to lead to more successful coping with um, negative stressful events. Bipolar disorders, um, oh, one final thing I didn't really explain um, with Depression is that it's pretty strongly linked to a reduction in the amount of serotonin in the brain. I feel like I mentioned that when we talked about neurotransmitters way back at the beginning of the school year, but um, depression is pretty strongly linked with either reduced serotonin in most cases or sometimes in reduced dopamine or norepinephrine. Um, that's why the drugs that treat depression, which 
impact the reuptake of serotonin are so effective. For bipolar disorders, there is a connection to neurotransmitters, but it's sort of unclear how, because bipolar disorder is a little more complex um, in terms of its neurotransmitter imbalance. Stressful events can also trigger the onset of bipolar disorder in someone who's predisposed. So you could not have bipolar disorder for you know your whole life, and then suddenly something stressful or traumatic happens, and it triggers it to start happening. Um, so drugs that reduce um, the re the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin have been shown to be effective for treating it. So if a person doesn't have enough serotonin in their brain, we block reuptake more of it stays in the synapse to be effective. Drugs that treat mania reduce the amount of norepinephrine in the brain. So um, there's some evidence that maybe a person with bipolar disorder has excessive norepinephrine when they're having manic episodes. Next category is the personality disorders. I have a pretty interesting, there are a lot of personality disorders here, and they're all um, related to basically inflexible and enduring personality patterns that tend to not change. So it's behavior, it's inner experience, um, it has to impair your social functioning or lead to distress. And I want you to pay special attention to this phrase here, deviates markedly from the culture. So the definition of normality and what the expected sort of socially normative behavior is, has a pretty strong impact on whether a person gets diagnosed with a personality disorder. I mentioned in the last video hysteria. Hysteria or hysterical personality disorder used to be in this category. Women would get diagnosed with hysteria because they were overly emotional, whatever that means. Um, but it was basically due to bias, due to sexism in culture that created this disorder to classify women with when they weren't um, willing to submit to the authority of men. So that disorder is no longer in the DSM because it was basically purely defined by culture. So this one is a little interesting in that we're um, using this definition of what's normal in a stronger way. Um, but the inflexibility of this is also important. People with personality disorders tend not to change. These patterns of behavior and of um, emotional experience tend to be more inflexible, more rigid than in, uh, than in sort of normal personalities. So there's a lot of different disorders in these in this category, I'm going to go through them quickly. There's an activity I'm going to ask you to do related to this involving diagnosing cartoon characters and comic book characters, because these fictional characters aren't real people. So we have nobody to offend by practicing diagnosis on them. So even though the rule, rule number one, no self-diagnosis, it's not self-diagnosis if you're diagnosing Harry Potter, for example. So I want you to do that activity after you finish this part of the notes. Cluster A, otter eccentric types. There's paranoid, schizoid and schizotypal personality disorder in this category. So paranoid personality disorder is about being really distrustful and suspicious of others. Schizoid personality disorder is about detachment. That This root, S-C-H-I-Z, that refers to separation or splitting. So schizoid, you're splitting from something, and in this case, you're splitting from other people, from social relationships. These people are really solitary, they're really aloof, they're really isolated, they don't want to interact with other people at all, they have no desire to form friendships. Um, this is not schizophrenia, it's a totally different thing. It's basically being an extreme loner. Schizotypal personality disorder sometimes can evolve into schizophrenia. So this one is about being... Um, really uncomfortable in close relationships, having really eccentric behavior, having sort of odd distortions in one's cognition or magical beliefs. Sometimes this can grow into full schizophrenia, which I will explain more later in the lecture. Cluster B, dramatic or emotionally problematic types. We have borderline, narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders in this category. We're going to start with borderline. Borderline personality disorder is called that because it's kind of about being on the borderline of changing one's mood at the drop of a hat, right? It's about instability. People with borderline personality disorder are unstable in just about every aspect of their life. They're unstable in their interpersonal relationships. One day they hate you, the next day they love you. They're unstable in their own self-image. Sometimes they're really confident and secure. Sometimes they're really insecure. Their own perception of themselves is always changing. Their emotions or mood is always in flux and they can be highly impulsive especially with self-harming behaviors. A common symptom of borderline personality disorder is harming oneself, either by intentionally sabotaging one's own relationships or with literal self-harm, like cutting. Um, narcissistic personality disorder is basically about a constant need for 
admiration and praise and recognition of oneself from other people all the time. It also comes with a total lack of empathy and a sense of entitlement. But the, the tragic thing about people with narcissism is that they tend to destroy all their personal relationships with this need for constant validation from others. But the reason they seek that constant sort of admiration and approval from others is that they have no ability to generate their own sense of self-worth. So they're like a black hole. Narcissists feel so empty inside. They, they cannot generate their own sense of self-worth. They cannot feel confident about themselves. They cannot de develop their own self-esteem. So they're constantly seeking recognition from others to try to make up for that. Um, histrionic personality disorder is about being excessively emotional, attention-seeking, um, and excessive need for approval. So it's kind of similar to narcissism, but without the self-importance and grandiosity. It's basically like, I need you to pay attention to me all the time to help me validate my existence. But it's not really about um, look how great I am. It's more about, please pay attention to me. An antisocial personality disorder, this one is formerly known as being a psychopath. So the fundamental sort of symptom of antisocial personality disorder is a disregard for the rights of others. I don't care about you. I don't care about what you believe in. I have no empathy for you at all. And you're nothing to me. That's basically what antisocial means. So there's a bunch of sort of symptoms listed here that a person with antisocial needs to do, at least three of them. Um, this is only diagnosable in adults. In children, the same behavior is called conduct disorder because most of the time in kids who display conduct disorder, it's due to the environment, um, due to abuse or neglect or violence in the home or something else, trauma. Um, so once, if the kid becomes an adult and they're still showing the same kind of behavior, that's when it can be okay, well, maybe this isn't just child neglect. Maybe this is actually antisocial personality. Um, people with antisocial personality disorder have lower levels of arousal overall. So they don't get as stressed out. They don't get as aroused or excited by any kind of event than other people. Um, they have reduced activity in their frontal lobes. So they're not planning. They're not thinking long term. They're not uh, making judgments or controlling their impulses as well as the neurotypical population. Um, there is a combination of genetic and environmental factors that create antisocial personality disorder. The, um, and that is further explained in this video that I've linked. It's a TED Talk to a psychiatrist and a researcher who studies antisocial personality disorder, and he goes into detail about explaining um, the genetic trigger and the environmental conditions that are needed to create it. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to watch that video. Cluster C of the personality disorders are avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Avoidant is about, um, it's sort of similar to social anxiety, but it's about avoiding social interaction because you feel inadequate. And so you're really sensitive to negative evaluation. The person is gonna feel really inadequate, like they're not good enough, and so they're going to hide themselves and inhibit their social interactions. Social anxiety disorder is dominated by a fear of criticism. Avoidant personality disorder is a pattern of behaviors and feelings of inadequacy along with that. So they're a little bit different. If you're confused about it, I encourage you to read about them in the DSM so that you can help understand the difference better. Dependent personality disorder is about excessively relying on other people to take care of all of your needs. Being very submissive, very clingy, you need someone to take care of you emotionally, to take care of you physically, basically acting like a little kid, even though you're a grown adult. Um, an obsessive compulsive personality disorder is what you think of when you think of OCD. So sort of the stereotype of OCD is that it's about being really controlling and like needing everything to be perfect all the time. That's not what real OCD is. That's obsess OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. I'm perfectionistic. I'm controlling. I need all of my behaviors to be a certain way. I need all of other people's behaviors to be a certain way. And I'm really preoccupied with everything being perfect. Now take a moment here. Make sure you're not breaking the rule right? No self-diagnosis, no diagnosis of your friends. If you have a friend who you think is kind of controlling and a perfectionist, that doesn't mean they have OCPD. It's a different level of severity. It's a different thing altogether, okay? Don't break the rule. The last category of disorders we're going to cover here is the schizophrenia spectrum or psychotic disorders. So in order to go through this, I'm going to have to explain what the different psychotic symptoms are and then I will explain to you what the different disorders are on the schizophrenia spectrum and which symptoms they have. So, psychotic disorder symptoms, they can either be positive or negative. Positive symptoms are like plus sign, things that are additional 
not present in neurotypical individuals, like hallucinations or delusional thoughts. Extra things that the normal population doesn't do. Negative symptoms is like minus sign, something is missing. Appropriate things that the normal population does exhibit that the psychotic person does not, like apathy, catatonia, like rigid body, expressionless face. You're not having any expressive reaction emotionally when you ought to. That's a negative symptom. So the symptoms further explained, delusions are fixed beliefs. Um, there are lots of different themes to people's delusions, but basically it's like, I have this belief about the way the world is and nothing you do will convince me otherwise. Hallucination is perception without sensation. It can be of any sense the most common hallucinations with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders are auditory, not visual. The movies would make you think that every time a person has a schizophrenic hallucination, it's seeing things that aren't there. Not true. Most commonly, it's hearing things. Um, but it can be of any sense, hearing, vision, touch, taste, smell. You can feel like things are touching you, that nothing's actually touching you. It can be any of the senses. Um, disorganized thinking is the third of the positive symptoms. Um, this is basically your thoughts are like chaos. So instead of the neurotypical population, when you think about a thing, it's a train of thought, right? There's a linear order, thing A, thing B, thing C, etc. There's a there's a flow to it. Disorganized thinking, things A, B, F, Q, and Z are all everywhere, and there's no logic. Topics are just switching from thing to thing. I ask you a question, your answer is unrelated. It can be incoherent speech, such as word salad. I encourage you to Google word salad examples just to see some examples of word salad um, because it's really interesting. The sentences are just a jumble of words with no order or syntax to them at all. And this disorganized thinking, it's not like ADD. It's not, you know, ADD is specifically focused to attention. This is about thoughts across the brain um, and it needs to be severe enough to impact functioning. So the fourth of the positive symptoms is abnormal motor behavior, um, silliness, unpredictable agitation. Um, it can be either moving around excessively or not moving at all. That's catatonia or motionlessness, resistance to instructions. You don't want to listen to what people tell you to do or being excessively active and kind of running around all over the place with no cause. Now, the negative symptoms are diminished or inappropriate emotional response, a volition, which means you don't want to do anything, decreased motivation, a logia, which is decreased speech, or anhedonia, which is decreased feelings of pleasure. So let's go through the disorders on the schizophrenia spectrum. The first one on the spectrum is actually schizotypal personality disorder. So remember when I said sometimes this evolves into full schizophrenia? It's actually the first stage on that ladder. Um, delusional disorder is when the person just has delusions. No other psychotic symptoms, but the delusions last at least, at least a month. Brief psychotic disorder is a sudden, like rapid onset of a handful of psychotic symptoms, but it's very short term. It lasts a month or less. Like a brief psychotic break, right? Schizophreniform disorder is basically schizophrenia that lasts less than six months. Full schizophrenia lasts six months or longer. So schizophrenia, you need to have two of the five psychotic symptoms I listed for most of a one month period. It has to pretty dramatically impact functioning. Schizophrenia is a very severe psychotic a mental disorder. Most of the time, people who are experiencing schizophrenia cannot take care of themselves. They have to have care or um, live in an institution or something because their functioning is so dramatically impacted. The signs of disturbance, like milder symptoms, would persist for at least six months or longer with acute symptoms lasting at least a month. So like milder hallucinations, vague speech instead of full word salad, unusual behavior instead of full um, abnormal motor behavior, and negative symptoms need to persist for six months or longer with acute strong symptoms lasting at least a month. Um, you can have it acutely where it kind of starts and then stops. It can be in remission where it's sort of gone away. We don't know if it's going to come back. Or it can be chronic where the person experiences these symptoms throughout their life. Um, some people with schizophrenia don't believe that they have an illness. Right? If I have a pretty strong delusional belief, how are you going to convince me that my belief isn't reality? Right? I'm not perceiving the reality the same as you. It's going to be difficult to convince me that I'm wrong. Um, there are plenty of mood symptoms like depression, anxiety, anger, problems with sleep or eating, hostility. Um, sometimes people with schizophrenia will experience dissociative symptoms or somatic symptoms as well. So schizophrenia is a pretty strong, pretty severe mental disorder. Um, a little... Uh, 
bit on how to try to understand where these psychotic symptoms come from. People with schizophrenia have a reduced brain volume overall. Um, in multiple brain regions, their brains are reduced in size. Um, there's also abnormal activity in the frontal cortex, the thalamus, and the amygdala, so emotional responses, control of sensory information, and impulse control. Adolescent schizophrenic patients show lesions in their brain, literal tissue loss, as the disorder is appearing. So it could be related to morphological changes or changes in the size and structure of the brain itself. There's a pretty strong biological link to schizophrenia. It is, has, also has a pretty strong genetic link. If you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, you have a much increased chance of developing it versus um, the general population. Psychologically, some um, environmental event or factor can trigger schizophrenia in people with a genetic predisposition. For example, these four sisters that are on the screen here, um, all four of them suffered from schizophrenia and they're identical quadruplets. So they're genetically identical. Statistically, only half of them should have had schizophrenia, but they all four did. So there was probably some contributing factor in their environment that was triggering it. Um, there are some warning signs. Um, if a parent has chronic schizophrenia, specifically the mother, complications at birth like oxygen deprivation, if, per if a child has a short attention span, poor muscle coordination, disruptive or withdrawn behavior, emotional unpredictability, and has trouble getting along with their friends, those are warning signs that that child might develop schizophrenia later. But just like with the risk factors for disorders in the previous lecture, these are correlational. So it's not clear that just because a child has ADD, for example, short attention span, they're always going to develop schizophrenia. It's not a cause and effect thing. This video that's linked here, that is a link to a demonstration of what an acute psychotic episode might feel like. So I encourage you to watch that. It's a really interesting, sort of scary experience. So it's like a first person view, kind of here's what schizophrenia might feel like for someone. I encourage you to watch that to get a more concrete example. That is it for mental disorders. I hope I will have time to teach you treatments. I want to focus on the disorders and make sure I get those covered. Um, we only have two weeks of school left, so I want to try to get the treatments in if I can, but we'll see what happens. Um, take care.